This is Al Jazeera. And live from Studio 14 here at Al Jazeera headquarters in Doha, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. Welcome to the news grid. The Philippines feels the force of Typhoon Mankut. Tens of thousands of people were evacuated before it hit, but there are reports of three deaths and six people missing. And now the year's biggest storm is heading towards Hong Kong and mainland China. Also on the grid, Ethiopia and a surprising political U-turn. After 26 years, members of the Oromo Liberation Front, a banned opposition group, have been welcomed back after it was removed from Ethiopia's terrorist list. We're going to look at why the government has changed its mind over the OLF and other opposition groups. And 10 years ago, at well, around this time actually, global markets were in a panic as Lehman Brothers Investment Bank filed for bankruptcy in the United States. This was seen as the trigger point for the global financial crisis, the worst part of it. So a decade later, we're assessing the recovery in America and in Europe. Some parents are spending more time with these than with their own kids. A boy in Germany started a protest against just that. I'm Leah Harding with more on that conversation. Connect with us with our hashtag AJ Newsgrid. You're with the News Grid live on air and streaming online through YouTube, Facebook Live and at aljazeera.com. And the strongest storm so far this year has smashed through the northern part of the Philippines. What began as a super typhoon, Mankat, yes, it lost some of its sting after it landed on Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines. But as you see, very strong conditions there, big waves, big wind. Thousands, tens of thousands of people had to flee their homes as it slashed through the northern tip of Luzon, killing... Latest reports at least 12 people, roughly 4 million people, quarter of which live on a few dollars a day, uh, were in the path of its destruction. So those are some of the pictures that we've seen of the aftermath uh, of uh, Typhoon Mankut. And here is what it's looking like on the satellite using windy.com. And if I run the animation, you're looking at it leaving the top of the Philippines there. And around about now, this is where it is. Uh, at the moment, as you see, heading towards, over the course of the early hours of Sunday, uh, Hong Kong and mainland China. Let's get this report now. It's Jamila Allendogan. She's reporting for us from the northern Philippines province of Cagayan. We are in Bagao, one of the areas to first bear the brunt of uh, the super typhoon. This is about an hour from Tugegarao City, but access is really quite difficult. Communication and power lines have been cut off. But on our way here, we bumped into a truck of Marine officers. Several have been seriously injured. We saw them being brought to the city um, in ambulances by volunteers. The situation in Bagao is similar, basically all across the region of Luzon. Hours after the typhoon made landfall, the government, both the national and local government, have yet to really assess the full impact of this typhoon. That is because many of these areas are in rural areas such as this one. We've spoken to civilians who have lost their homes, who have lost their livelihood, and they know basically that life will set them back even further. They already went through something similar two years ago, and it's taken them time to recover. They say what they want right now is emergency relief help, food, medicine, and power. Earlier in the day, we spoke to Richard Gordon, who's chairman and CEO of the Philippines Red Cross. He says that if there are landslides, presents another problem, blocking the delivery of aid. We're still early days here, and uh, we just reached the... Uh principal focus of the landfall of the storm, Bagao, and we're seeing about 90% of crop damage already, and a lot of the homes have lost their roofs. There'll be a lot of roofing materials that will have to be replaced, and a lot of walls. A lot of houses have been uh, uh, destroyed, uh, some totally, a lot partially. And, uh, of course, uh, there will be an awful requirement for, uh, uh, in terms of... Uh, livelihood and in terms of uh, markets are still closed, so people will have to be supplied with food in the meantime. And uh, we have the major, major artery going to the north that is going to make it difficult for us to supply, uh, you know, materials. Dalton Pass uh, is uh, blocked by landslides and flooding, so uh, I hope that we can uh, uh, uh, mitigate that right away. 
So Typhoon Mangkut, as we saw on the satellite, now heading across the South China Sea, could strengthen again, actually, as it goes through that water uh, before hitting southern China in around 24 hours. The government there has issued the second highest storm alert. Ferry services across Guangdong province have been suspended with heavy rain and huge floods forecast over the weekend. Billboards have even been taken down in case they're blown down by the winds, which are expected to hit 200 kilometres an hour. So that is what's happening in the Philippines. Meanwhile, Hurricane Florence has been downgraded to a tropical storm. This is in the United States. But there are still concerns of flooding as it moves across the Carolinas, dumping heavy amounts of rain. Some areas have ordered people to leave their homes as the waters rise. And more than half a million people are without power, the storm being blamed for at least seven deaths as well. Reporting for us from Wilmington, North Carolina, it is Andy Gallagher, who, uh, well, it's looking a lot calmer than it was 24 hours ago. I guess the concern is going to be rising water. It is, Kamal, and, and what uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is saying is they're in recovery and response mode right now, which essentially means that they're waiting and watching to see what happens over the next 48 hours. But the good thing about that is that the winds have now died down here. Florence is now a tropical storm, so they have helicopters and troops on standby. They'll start putting those helicopters up to look for damage, to look for uh, uh, rivers possibly cresting, but it's really all about the rainfall now as this storm just kind of lingers and isn't really moving. If they get the kind of rainfall that they are predicting, and we really haven't had much here, uh, there's a fear about mudslides, a fear about rivers inland bursting their banks and putting communities at risk. Uh, we have had seven confirmed deaths, uh, two here in Wilmington, a mother and her infant child when a tree fell on her house. But the storm, for the most part, has, has passed here. The river down the street from me, uh, the Cape Fear River, has breached its banks, uh, but that hasn't been too bad in this location. North of us, in the outer banks, there's uh, been some smaller communities where there have been some rescue efforts there. There are about 7,500 people in shelters now. They're well provided for. There are generators running. So really, this is, as the FEMA uh, and the emergency authorities are talking about, just a respond and recovery, a kind of wait and see what happens over the next couple of days. Um, not to put you at the centre of the story, Andy, but I'm interested to know, and just for our viewers, how you and the crew have been uh, doing your job there. I see you've got is it a bit of plastic over your microphone there. I'm just wondering, maybe give our viewers a bit of behind the scenes of how you actually report through all this weather. I mean, we're used to doing this. We've done lots of these kinds of storms. For us, too, it's about preparation. You know, we're running power. We lost power uh, sometime yesterday morning, so we're running off uh, car batteries, things like that. Uh, but really, this is something that we're used to. It's not, it's not terribly hard for us compared to what the local communities are going through. Uh, fuel is a problem, not just for us, but for everybody else. You have to stock up on as much fresh water and as much uh, perishables as you can get your hands on. And that's similar for people here, too. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it here didn't really get hit that hard. We were actually in the eye of the storm when it made landfall. Uh, but all those predictions, are, they were talking at one point about a four metre high tidal surge, which would have swallowed the buildings here behind me. That didn't happen, at least in Wilmington. As I said, it was the communities north of us that were hit harder. But it's a slow motion nature of all this. It's a slow motion crisis. I think that's the best way to look at it, because they simply don't know how much this tropical storm will, will drop rain on these communities inland and how badly they'll be affected. All right, so we'll be talking to you more, I think, in the next couple of days. Andy Gallagher, thank you for that in uh, Wilmington. And if you want to get in touch with us, if you've ever got a question for one of our correspondents, throw them in, won't you? Hashtag AJ Newsroom or send them directly to me at Kamala AJ Ebu. I know that you'll probably be interested in how our teams operate out in the field in some trying conditions sometimes, so do that. Or you can tweet at AJ English, reply to the threads there, and our producers will look for your responses. You can watch the live stream, of course, at facebook.com slash Al Jazeera. Comment amongst yourselves and with us. Or hop on your phone, plus 974501-11149, Telegram and WhatsApp. You can message us directly. Uh, now, we're going to look at uh, Ethiopia. Once banned freedom fighters in Ethiopia have been actually given a hero's welcome home. The leader of the Oromo Liberation Front, the OLF, his name is Dawood Ibsa, as well as 1,500 fighters, returned to Addis Ababa after 26 years in neighbouring Eritrea. The OLF's been fighting for self-determination for Ethiopia's largest ethnic group since the 1970s. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed removed the OLF from a terrorism list early this year as part of political reforms. Well, the leaders of the OLF are just the latest opposition members to return home. Uh, a week ago, it was leaders of the Ginbot 7 who'd had a homecoming. They'd been in exile for more than 10 years when their party was outlawed. 
Uh, the OLF, Ginbot and the Ogaden National Liberation Front had been on the government's terror list for years. But in July, Parliament voted to remove them and the new Prime Minister invited them to come back and to take part in the country's political process in a peaceful manner. Unlike his predecessors, Prime Minister Ahmed has acknowledged his country has no option but to pursue multi-party democracy. We have got Jawar Mohammed with us now, Executive Director at Oromia Media Network, joining us on Skype from Addis Ababa. Thank you for your time, uh, Jawar. I mean, this is an exciting day, I guess, for the uh, Oromo and for many other political groups. Why is it happening now? Is it all down to this new Prime Minister? It's a historic day indeed, after uh, almost 50 years of struggle and after being founded some 40 years ago, the OLF has come home. And uh, about 4 million people attended today's event. Uh, it's a historic day. Uh, the reason is uh, the Oromo region, the Oromo region has been uh, protesting for the last four years. They have been the primary cause of the change. They forced the authoritarian government to undertake reform. And we're in the past to transition. Uh, and today's event shows uh, a significant milestone towards uh, reconcil reconciliation, uh, reconstruction and transition to democracy. It's an exciting time and a, a very special day. Do you think the Oromo can really now have a voice? I know you've been obviously struggling for that voice for so long. Do you think the Oromo can integrate properly into the political process after so many years out of it? Yes, indeed. I think uh, the integration is the only way forward. Uh, now we do have the, an Oromo prime minister who has shown that the Oromos have a vested interest in transitioning the country to democracy and keeping the country together. Uh, this has been the most hopeful time this country has ever seen since, uh, since this establishment. There is a lot of excitement. I came back here months ago. Uh, the happiness and the excitement, uh, uh, optimism in this country has, uh, is intoxicating. Uh, and there is a negotiation, there is a discussion going on on all corners. And, and the Oromos are showing that they can lead this country, uh, they can lead it, uh, they can wage a uh, peaceful struggle, they can take power and they can control power uh, responsibly and they can transition the country to democracy. Uh, yes, the Oromos will not only integrate, but they will, they will unite and push this country forward. And the other opposition groups as well, do you, do you, do you talk to them? Do you, do you discuss, I guess, the future path forward for the opposition? Uh, yes. In the past, we were uh, a medium for only for the ruling party. Now, the state controlled media is entertaining all kinds of opinions. Uh, there are various opposition groups who are, who are coming from abroad, uh, others who are underground coming up. up. Uh, there is an ongoing negotiation. There is a plan for a national uh, conference to pave the way for a peaceful uh, election in the coming uh, two years. Uh, yes, there is a negotiation, there is a dialogue. Uh, of course, it's not enough, but uh, the starting, the beginning is very promising. Jawa Mohammed uh, joining us from Addis Ababa. Thanks so much for your time. Do appreciate it. Uh, so, Ethiopia, it's clearly an interesting case in Africa, isn't it? Progressive. Uh, looking country. And the Listing Post team looked at that only last month, the reforms which new Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed promised and how social media actually uh, drove a lot of that, pushing for the change uh, within the established media as well. Richard Gisbert with that one. If you search for Ethiopia social media at aljazeera.com, click the programs filter at the side and look for that from the Listening Post. Meanwhile, in Rwanda, President Paul Kagame has off ordered the release of a jailed opposition leader. Victoire Ingabire was detained in 2010 when she opposed Kagame in the presidential election. She was sentenced to 15 years behind bars for terrorism charges in 2013. Ingabire, one of more than 2,000 prisoners whose sentences have now been cut with very little explanation. Now, the leader of the regional bloc in South America, isn't ruling out military intervention to overthrow Venezuela's president. This is the OAS, the Organization of American States. Its secretary general has been speaking to Venezuelan migrants in Colombia. Remember, at least 1.5 million people have fled Venezuela due to political and economic stability, putting a lot of strain on resources in neighboring countries. As Alessandro Grampietti reports now from Cututa on the Colombia-Venezuela border. The Secretary General of the OAS, Luis Almagro, is swamped by Venezuelan migrants and photographers as he tries to make his way through the Simón Bolívar Bridge. 
Migrants shout freedom for Venezuela as others shake Almagro's hand and cry for help. We need them to do something, anything. We need countries to unite to help democracy and food to return to Venezuela. The visit to the Colombian border town of Cúcuta is the first stop of a series of meetings in countries across South America, strained by the growing exodus of Venezuelans. A newly formed work group has been tasked to design a more coordinated regional response to this unprecedented mass migration. At a press conference, Almagro said only restoring democracy in Venezuela can solve the crisis and that a military intervention can't be ruled out. As for military intervention to overthrow the Maduro regime, I think that we should not rule out any option, because definitively the Nicolas Maduro regime is perpetrating crimes against humanity towards its population and violations of human rights. The suffering of the people in this induced exodus it is driving means that diplomacy remains the first option, but we can't exclude any action. Colombian authorities are asking for financial aid and want the United Nations to appoint a special representative to coordinate the international response. Almost a million Venezuelans are currently living in Colombia, but the real number is likely higher. As authorities make it more difficult for Venezuelans to cross legally, new unofficial and often dangerous routes open up as migrants make their way to countries as far as Ecuador and Peru. This is the scene repeating itself day after day here at the border. We've been here just 10 minutes and we've seen dozens and dozens of Venezuelan migrants trying to cross illegally into Colombia. Many of them carry bags to try to smuggle meat or scrap metal or truly anything they can sell for real money to continue their journey. We haven't had anything to eat for four days. We bring metal and plastic. I don't know how much I will make with this, but at least enough for a piece of bread. A more structured regional response to the crisis might help struggling receiving countries like Colombia. But no one believes that unless there's real change in Venezuela, that the flood can be stopped. Alessandro Rampietti, Al Jazeera, Cúcuta. On Skype from Caracas now, Lucas Kerner, who's a political analyst with the news website VenezuelaAnalysis.com. Nice to see you, Lucas. You know, the way that the OAS Secretary General was talking there, saying, you know, we wouldn't rule out an overthrow because I think his words were that Maduro was committing crimes against humanity, against his own people. It leads me to wonder, is, in your opinion, Maduro the problem? Is he the difference between Venezuela doing well and Venezuela not doing well? I think that this kind of discourse coming from the Secretary General is very irresponsible, especially in light of the failed humanitarian interventions in Libya and you know other countries that have made the situation much worse and have contributed to massive refugee crises. That you know clearly, I think for the majority of Venezuelans, the problems in Venezuela are largely economic and not political. And they they want whether they voted for Maduro or not in May in the presidential elections that were held, they want the national government to take decisive measures to resolve the crisis, which up till now it has yet to take. However, it's a multifaceted crisis, and there's no doubt that U.S. initiated economic sanctions, which are illegal and you know, under international law, are playing a role in accentuating this crisis, denying the Venezuelan government, for example, $1 billion in Citco dividends that could be used to ameliorate the migra migratory crisis. And I think that this whole framing of a migratory crisis is also slightly deceiving, because, uh, deceptive in a certain sense that we see, the, according to the UN's Migratory Authority, the, the number that they put for Venezuelans living abroad, including those who have been living abroad for decades, is 2.3 million. Mm. This, com this obviously contrasts with the figures of 4 million, 5 million. And we take that there are currently 5 million Colombians living in Venezuela who are refugees of the Colombian Civil War. Okay. And this is not talked about. And we're receiving all kinds of government social programs in Venezuela. So if... President Maduro is, as you say, he's the leader, he is the elected leader. If he is to really lead his country out of this crisis, what does he need to do? What is the first big acute step which can be taken to improve things or at least start to improve things? Well, I think there's a consensus both, you know, from the left to the right among economists that they, you really need to take decisive action on the foreign exchange system, that mm. uh, currency controls exchange, uh, that have been in place 
since uh, 2003 need to be lifted and the currency needs to be allowed to float. And until you do that, you're not going to be able to address hyperinflation. However, the problem with doing that is you need to have sufficient re international reserve to enable that to happen. And that is very difficult given the financial sanctions in the country that, pr that prohibit international lending and uh, prohibit renegotiation of existing loans. Well, you know, certainly the $5 billion that the government has received in loans from China just recently will help. But there needs to be when there needs to be a process of de-escalation and depolarization that needs to begin with Mr. Almagro and Mr. Trump in Washington and and attempt and really uh, rolling back these illegal sanctions and giving the, the the economy room to breathe, which is the precondition if you want to um, resolve this economic crisis. So who is on Venezuela's side then? Who's on Nicolas Maduro's side? Because we're talking a lot about the people who aren't, and as you say, the ones who are ostensibly making it more difficult for him. And then you get the OAS saying what it's saying. Who's on Maduro's side? Well, I think that certainly the the vast majority of Venezuelan people, you know, according to polls, want the economy to get better. And you know, in fact, you know, U U.S. sanctions are deeply unpopular with over 60 percent of the population opposing them, according to uh, conservative pollster data analysis. So, I mean, I think there's Maduro does have a significant block of the Venezuelan population on his side in opposing these sanctions and in trying to take steps towards economic recovery. And likewise, he does have regional actors like, um, you know, certain, you know, Uruguay, Bolivia. Uh, to some extent, um, Cuba, Nicaragua, traditional friends, but also China that, you know, are interested in, you know, ensuring that Venezuela does not, you know, coll further collapse into this, you know, economic uh, downward spiral. So I think that there definitely is, there, there is support for, there is opposition to these this kinds of uh, coup mongering, which we've seen in the recent assassination attempt. And certainly mm -hmm. these kinds of efforts to overthrow the government by force, as we saw in early August, are deeply unpopular. Lucas Kerner joining us from Caracas. Thank you so much for that. Thanks for having me. And, uh, oops, oh, you know, I was going to show you something there. It's just disconnected. I'm going to talk for a little bit and try and reconnect here. Uh, it's something which is actually brand new to AlJazeera.com this Saturday. Have we got it? Yes, it's talked to... Uh, it's Talk to Al Jazeera. And actually, this is called Talk to Al Jazeera in the field. This is when we move away from formal interviews with the big names and talk to the everyday people. In this case, uh, three Venezuelans sharing their hopes and fears for the future. I think the most telling quote, if I just go down a little bit here, is this one. Uh, someone who said, if Chavez were alive, this would not be happening. Talk to Al Jazeera. It is in the shows section at aljazeera.com. And then you just click the in the field uh, menu at the top and you'll come to this one. Uh, now, if you do want to get in touch with us, please do. Uh, who have I heard from? Manilos on Facebook, who said, this is what happens when you become what you hate. <laughs> Referring to uh, Nicolas Maduro there. Uh, it was good to get the thoughts of Lucas Kerner, wasn't it, in Caracas, someone living it and experiencing it there. If you've got any more thoughts and questions, do send them through to us. The hashtag is AJ News Grid, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Telegram. You can tweet me directly at Kamal AJE as well. This is the News Grid. <laughs> Excuse me, if you're with us on Facebook Live, you're about to see the story of the baby painter in Pakistan who's turning buses into art. That is from our friends at AJ+. And then later, NASA launches a satellite into orbit to measure the thickness of Arctic ice sheets and the tree canopies in the tropics. We're going to look at how it will use lasers from space to monitor climate change. Redford, we are going to do VMC guys. We are going to do that. My work, my work, all of Pakistan is very good. Karachi, Sindh, Adhrabad, Pindi, Shawar, Lahore, Multan. But it's a little bit of a problem.
ਕਲਮ ਨਾਲ ਤਸਵੀਰਾਂ ਬਣਦੀਆਂ ਸਨ ਕਲਮ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਰੇ ਕੰਮ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਸੀ ਸਿਵੀਆਂ ਵਗੈਰਾ ਹਰ ਚੀਜ਼ ਕਲਮ ਨਾਲ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਸੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਟਾਈਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੱਦ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਬੜਾ ਕੰਮ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਸੀ ਹੁਣ ਮਸ਼ੀਨੀ ਕੰਮ ਆ ਗਿਆ ਆਪਣੇ ਹਿਸਾਬ ਨਾਲ ਵੀ ਬੜਾ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤੀ ਕੰਮ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਵਾਹ ਵੀ ਪਸੰਦ ਕਰਤੀ ਹੈ ਟਰਾਂਸਪੋਰਟ ਵੀ ਪਸੰਦ ਕਰਤੀ ਹੈ ਹਮ ਖੁਦ ਪਸੰਦ ਕਰਤੇ ਹਾਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਵੀ ਕੀ ਬਾਤ ਕਰਨੀ ਗਾੜੀ ਅੱਛੀ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਉਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਹਮ ਬੈਠੇ ਗਏ ਗਾੜੀ ਮਾਟੀ ਮਾੜੀ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਉਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਹਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਬੈਠੇ ਬੋਰ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਬਹਿ ਬਹਿ ਕੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਇਹ ਬਿਮਾਰੀ ਨਾ ਵਜਾ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਇਹ ਬਸਾ ਦੀ ਲੱਗ ਦੀ ਪੇਟ ਟੜ ਦੀ ਸਿੰਨ ਕੈਮੀਕਲ ਥਿਨਲ ਵਗੈਰਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪਟਰੋਲ ਕੈਮ ਵਕਤ ਪਾਸ ਕਰਨਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਟਾਈ ਵੀ ਚਲੋ ਦਿਨ ਲੱਗਾ ਰਹਿੰਦਾ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਦੇ ਚਾਰ ਦਿਨ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਪੂਰੇ ਕਰਨੇ ਨੇ ਅੱਡੇ ਜੀ ਕੁਛ ਫਿਰ ਤੁਰ ਕੇ ਨਿਕਲ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਚਲੋ ਸ਼ਿਕਰ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਸ਼ੁਗਲ ਮੇਲਾ ਕਰ ਲਈਦਾ ਕਿਸੇ ਨਾਲ ਆ ਕੇ ਮੈਂ ਉੱਥੇ ਲਈਦਾ ਕਿਸੇ ਨਾਲ ਗੱਪਾਂ ਮਾਰ ਲਈਦਾ ਮੈਂ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਨਵੇਂ ਲੋਕ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨਾ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਮਤਲਬ ਕਿ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਦੇ ਪੈਸੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਜੋੜ ਸਕਿਆ ਖਰਚੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਪੂਰਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਸੀ ਬੱਚੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਪੜਾ ਸਕਿਆ ਹਾਲਾਤ ਨੇ ਸਾਥ ਨਹੀਂ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਮੇਰਾ headlines from aljazeera.com and what's trending as well why is the indian rupee asia's worst faring currency today this is part of our look back after 10 years of or since the start of the global financial crisis and we'll be looking at that more uh, in depth on uh, news grid a little bit later on there's an interesting story at number 5 there a sports daughter sports story the cricketer in moin ali who's claimed uh, he was called osama by an australian player because of his uh, his long beard i guess have a look at that Anything else that takes your fancy at aldezero.com what's trending this Saturday Now the two sons of Egypt's former president Hosni Mubarak have been arrested they are now in prison facing charges of insider trading Ala and Gamal Mubarak along with at least seven other suspects are accused of making unlawful profits after they allegedly broke financial trading rules it's related to the sale of a national bank uh, both deny any wrongdoing Of course their father Hosni ruled Egypt from 1981 until the revolution of 2011 when he was replaced uh, by eventually the democratically elected Mohamed Morsi. We've got Sahar Aziz with us a professor of law at Rutgers Law School joining us on Skype from New York. Nice to have you with us. I think maybe a little bit of uh, context or background first of all where and what have Hosni Mubarak's sons been doing in the past few years because they were along with their father in and out of jail eventually uh, cleared have they been uh, what has been off them Well the timing is not coincidental because in the last year and a half particularly in the run up to the 2018 presidential elections Gamal Al Ala were seen multiple times in public in ways that made them appear uh, very connected to the people and down to earth and at a time when the economy has been struggling and it's affected many Egyptians from the upper middle class all the way to the poor because the subsidies are being removed inflation is high wages are stagnant and so many Egyptians reminisce and lament to the days of the Mubarak era from the economic perspective So when Gamal and Alaq come out in public and are spotted and it's all over social media this signals to the regime that they may be seeking to get back into the limelight and into political life. And if there's one thing that is clear about the failed revolution of 2011 mm. is that although democracy didn't take root in Egypt what did happen is that there was a change in the governance structure. the old regime that was within the mubarak's inner circle including his sons is out 
and the new regime are the younger military officers and their own economic elite and their own former military generals who are now becoming very active in the economy. So the current regime does not want Ala or Mubarak to be in the public limelight or for the people to even be thinking of them as potential uh, political actors. Sahar Aziz, thank you so much for that. Really well explained to us. They're joining us from New York today. Thank you. So um, I, and I'm sure many other people can remember being in our newsroom 10 years ago at pretty much this exact moment, watching an economic crisis unfold. It was the start of a working week and Lehman Brothers, one of the most famous investment banks in the world, had filed for bankruptcy. And it was at that very point that an already serious banking crisis on Wall Street got a whole lot worse. If you were watching yesterday, you would have seen this grid, uh, graph, which I showed you on the grid, does of the benchmark Dow Jones Industrial Average Index. Uh, it's from 2007 to 2009, basically the Dow Jones Wall Street. Um, so that's where we are. That's the 10 years ago, September the 15th. And I'm going to highlight a couple of other points for you as well, just so you can see how fast the decline was. 10 years ago, the market was at 11,388 points. In just three weeks, by October the 6th, we were looking at 8,451. And then down here, these really dark days, the market hit a low of 6,626 points. All of that happened in just six months. The market lost almost half its value and they were dark, dark days. But remember, this became a global crisis and it's worth remembering how far all that bad news spread. If you start with Greece, which only just talking a month or so ago, got out of austerity mode after 10 years of hardship. Greece took three bailouts, totaling $352 billion from the EU and the international money, monetary fund since 2010. Cyprus fell hard because of its large exposure to Greek debt. It got a $13 billion bailout. But in a controversial and unprecedented mood, everybody with money deposited in a Cypriot bank was made to pay for the bailout. Ireland, one of the first European countries to enter recession and then an economic depression in 2009, 34,500 people left Ireland by 2010, which was the largest net immigration they had seen since 1989. Over the water in the UK, there was the worst recession since 1980, the biggest casualty, Northern Rock, which was the fifth largest lender uh, because of the mortgage crisis it went under. And there was the curious case of Iceland, where in 2008, the banking system was no longer trusted. Inflation and interest rates rose. It was so bad, the Icelandic national currency, the krona, was worth not a lot more than the Zimbabwean dollar, which was barely worth anything. The difference in Iceland, though, is the banks were left to fail there. A country not on that list, though, is Germany, a robust, strong European economy, which managed to steer clear of trouble. But there are those who accuse Germany of being too strong, certainly in its financial decision-making, which they say helped wreck the Greek economy in the end with all those bailouts. Lawrence Lee reports from Berlin on how that stance is being viewed a decade later. In the corridors of power in Berlin, there are reasons to be cheerful. Ten years ago, the German economy was so well insulated that the big crash was never going to cause a crisis. So much has changed in other European countries, but not here. In the first six months of this year alone, the German economy ran a budget surplus of over 50 billion dollars. That's almost 3% of Germany's gross domestic product or annual wealth. It's the kind of figure that makes other countries either extremely jealous or absolutely furious. It was the German government that demanded, after the bank started to fall, that the European Commission impose new rules on countries like Greece, forcing them to adopt hugely destructive tax-raising powers in return for bailouts and loans. A decade on, stagnant economies and huge unemployment levels are what's left. The proceeds went to the banks, not the people. Many economists hold Germany directly responsible for bankrupting Greece. It is a very anti-democratic approach, but it is something that gives assurance to German politicians that there are rules and that they can be uh, adhered to and that things will work out. But um, I think that kind of comfort is illusionary. In its defence, Germany would argue that if other countries had behaved in the right way in the first place, then there wouldn't have been a problem. Most of the political class here bears few regrets about driving policies which proved so controversial. No, absolutely not. I think that was the only way. The fact that we are successful in all these countries uh, shows that this was the right way. And it's like in the, it's like in the private uh, sphere. Um, if you don't have debt, 
you are a free man. And if you ha have that, um, you have to listen to uh, the, the persons who gave you the money. The one area which Germany has suffered from in recent years has been the rise of far-right populism, born partly from economics in poor areas, but also from anger towards Chancellor Merkel's generous asylum policies for refugees. This week, though, the German government announced it was devoting billions of euros to tackle long-term unemployment, a certain way of diffusing anger. Germany is able to make these choices in ways others can only dream about. Lawrence Lee, Al Jazeera, Berlin. With us now from New York, Jeff Madrick. He's the director of the Rediscovering Government Initiative at the Century Foundation, also the author of the book Age of Greed. Jeff, nice to have you with us on this uh, auspicious anniversary, shall we say. Just on the issue of uh, Europe and Germany, as you were hearing about in that report, looking back, do you think that Germany was too harsh with its demands on a country like Greece, or did it take the action that was, that was needed at the time, the sort of prudent, harsh action that might have been needed? I'm glad you asked me that question. They were unquestionably too harsh. Their view of uh, international economics and their own economics is quite backward, actually. It, uh, the idea that governments should always be in surplus, that they should have as little debt as possible, is unrealistic and merciless, frankly. The proper action that should have been taken was debt forgiveness in this period. That's how the world works. When we didn't forgive those debts, those people suffered badly, and it took a long time for them to recover. A more sensible policy helping Greece would have enabled them to rise more rapidly and pay back their debts. And let me remind you of this. They talk haughtily about how people have to pay back their debts. The German banks were lending to Greece and other uh, smaller and slow-growth countries. They made enormous profits. You used the word recover in there, and we are 10 years on, and a lot of countries, economies, businesses have recovered. Greece only just coming out of the austerity, to be fair. A recovery is only worthwhile if you learn from the lessons. And that's what I want to know what you think. Have we learned from the lessons? If there were to be the same sort of pressures on the banking system that we saw 10 years ago, have the lessons been learned? The lessons have not been entirely learned. Mm. Some lessons have been learned. We had a bill here, a broad piece of legislation, as you well know, called Dodd-Frank, mm -hmm. which did re-regulate much of the banking sector. We are turning back on some of those regulations. One of the bigger problems, however, is regulations of the non-bank bank sectors, the so-called shadow banking community, which includes insurance companies, hedge funds, investment managers. They are now making the sorts of loans that the banks made that led to the crisis, and they are by and large unregulated. The two great causes of the crisis were wanton, reckless, irresponsible lending on the part of what we thought were conservative banks, especially to buy mortgages, and irresponsible lack of regulation on the part of Washington, which had to do a lot to do with unintelligent analyses of how economies work, undue faith in free markets to settle all problems uh, fairly. Jeff Madrick joining us from New York on this 10th anniversary of the collapse of Lehman. Thank you so much, Jeff. Here is Leah now. Um, so yeah. if, I'm just thinking 10 years ago, social media wasn't quite what it is now. No, Twitter is only two years old, actually. Yeah, Little so, baby Twitter. So what have you managed to dig up, I guess, from that time? Well, for starters, the uh, beginning of the global market crash, it was followed by anger and protest, and we saw that happening all over the world. We first saw major reaction to the crash a few years after the 2008 downturn with the start of the Occupy Wall Street protests. Thousands were protesting in major cities across the U.S., calling for transparency and for a change in having the top 1% having all of the wealth and control. We're seeing similar protests today with the hashtag 10 years on. People in front of the Bank of England in London just a few hours ago were chanting the banks were bailed out, 
we were sold out. Others are using the hashtag change finance to organize similar protests in cities across Europe, the United States, and even in their union islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Changefinance.org says it's calling out people to stand up against politicians instead of sleepwalking into what they say could be another financial crisis. Part of their campaign tracks where protests are happening and how people can join in. They also give protesters ideas like creating Twitter storms online, even blowing bubbles in front of banks and wrapping crime scene tape around banks, whatever works, right? For those affected by the economic collapse, though, the anniversary is a painful reminder of what happened. But for some former Lehman Brothers staff, it's a chance to party. A letter leaked last month revealed bankers were getting together in London to mark with cocktails a decade since the collapse. The letter addressed to Lehman Brothers and Sisters invited alumni of the company to a private party, which uh, by the British Labour Party was criticized as saying criticized it, saying that it was disgraceful. Now, the financial crisis was caused by bad deals, but it also gave birth to some good deals, ones that literally stuck around for years. The Subway $5 footlong deal started as a way to help customers impacted by the crash, and within two weeks, it drove sales up to 25%. Ten years later, and Subway is only just now saying the deal is coming to an end. Though the deal might not be around anymore, I can assure you the song will be stuck in your head for the rest of the day. Come on. <sighs> Makes me want a Subway sandwich, actually. I know. Uh, it really <laughs> thanks, does. Leah. I uh, thought it'd be interesting to look back at an article like this from AltaZero.com, which was published exactly 10 years ago. It was the views of a number of financial analysts on what it all meant, remembering we were right in the middle of all the chaos at that time. You know, there's no benefit of hindsight. Uh, one of them, where was it? Here, Andrew Critchlow, a bit further down. Uh, I liked this. I think the impact is going to be quite profound. That turned into pretty much the understatement of the decade, didn't it? Just search for what Lehman will mean for the world uh, and see if you agree with what the experts were predicting 10 years ago. Hard to believe it was that long ago, my goodness. Now, the US space agency NASA has launched an advanced space laser into orbit. This is going to be used to measure how much ice remains on Earth as, of course, global warming continues to shrink the ice caps. It comes at a time when some climate change projects have been cancelled by the US administration and other individuals, meanwhile, are spotting a gap in the market. Leah will have more on that in a moment. First, this report from Hibber Morgan. Three, two, one. NASA is calling it its most advanced space laser. Launched on Saturday, ISAT-2, a half-ton satellite, will orbit on a billion-dollar mission to find out how much of the Earth's ice is melting as the climate warms. ISAT-2 is all about measuring elevation, and a natural question is how do you know you're getting the right answer? We'll go out and collect a reference data set, we'll be ready to compare and evaluate green laser light from the satellite it bounces off of this thing and goes right back up to the satellite again, super reflective. So these things is show up in data with uh, altimeters like ISAT-2. ISAT-2 is the first mission in nearly a decade that will be measuring ice levels. Its predecessor, ISAT, launched in 2003, operated for six years. The new satellite will use an advanced laser and camera system known as ATLAS to measure how long it takes individual particles of light to leave the satellite, bounce off Earth and return. These tests will be repeated four times a year, providing scientists with a continuous record detailing changes in the ice. It will also help them better understand the relationship between the melting ice sheets and the rising sea. Scientists have been warning for a number of years that the global average temperature is rising. The four hottest years on record have been the last four. And the constant reliance on fossil fuels for energy means levels of greenhouse gases continue to mount. But the U.S. administration and the President Donald Trump seems intent on slashing projects that aim to study and curb climate change. The ISAT-2 mission should last three years, but has enough fuel to continue for 10 if the mission managers decide to extend its life. But that will depend not on the scientists, but on politicians. Hiba Morgan, Al Jazeera. Well, someone else is trying to launch a satellite in California. It's none other than the governor himself. In California, with science under attack, 
In fact, we're under attack by a lot of people, including Donald Trump, but the climate threat still keeps growing. So we want to know what the hell's going on all over the world all the time. So we're going to launch our own satellite, our own damn satellite to figure out where the pollution is and how we're going to end it. Brown is also known as the Governor Moonbeam, and he's teaming up with Planet Labs, a company that specializes in satellite imaging to track emissions linked to climate change. Here, their satellite documented deforestation by, a, uh, by forests in the Amazon because of a farm that was being built. And in Bolivia, the rise in sugarcane production has been a major reason for more trees to get cut down. Now, the governor warned that if Trump cut funding for satellites collecting data on the climate, then California would launch its own. But the reaction to the announcement has been mixed. Some people, like Teresa here, say that money should be used to help people rather than throwing it in satellites and trains to nowhere, she says. Others, like Mark, are asking the governor whether the satellite will be launched using green energy. A good question, Mark. But Governor Brown's vision is not limited to space. Our colleagues at AJ Plus looked into his vision to a cleaner future for his state. California is committed to doing whatever is necessary to meet the existential threat of climate change. And yes, it is an existential threat. It is a real present danger to California and to the people of the world. This bill and others I'm going to sign this week help us go in this direction. But have no illusions. California and the rest of the world have miles to go before we achieve zero carbon emissions. SB 100 is sending a message to California and to the world that we're going to meet the Paris Agreement and we're going to continue down that path uh, to transition our economy to zero emission, uh, zero carbon emission, and to have the resiliency and the sustainability that science tells us we must achieve. If you're in California, let us know what you think of your governor's efforts. Our hashtag is always AJ Newsgrade. Yeah, thank you once again for the Facebook Live crew. A bonus story for you about a one-of-a-kind cafe in Turkey. It's helping change the lives of its baristas and bringing some joy to its customers. And then ahead of a huge world title fight between two world boxing championships, Golovkin and Camelo, uh, we're going to be speaking to a former world champion who's faced off with the Mexican himself. Amir Khan is on the way. Para kazanıyorum, mutluyum. İlk paramla aileyi yeniye çıkarttım, ondan da mutluyum. Özgüvenimi kazandım. Bizim buradaki amacımız Down sendromlu gençlerimizin bağımsız olarak ayaklarının üzerinde durabilmelerini istiyoruz. Biz onların e, toplumda hem iş hayatının içinde hem sosyal hayatın içinde var olmalarını amaçladık. Bizim tek isteğimiz bizi sevsinler, saysınlar, daha çok önem versinler buraya gelmelerini istiyoruz.
So I'm guilty of this. I know it because I'm a dad and I host a social media show and I'm on my phone way too much. Yeah. The auto cue says, Leah, tell me my flaws. I did write that. How long have you got? Well, we don't have enough time in this show, <laughs> but we could do that on another episode. Usually parents tell their kids to get off their phones, but some kids are just flipping those roles. In Germany, it turned into a protest led by kids. Seven-year-old Emil Rastige started the movement after saying his dad just spent too much time with his gadget. His slogan, play with me, not your phone. Emil's dad said he realized he was paying more attention to his phone when, than his kids when Emil told him to put his phone down to enjoy a moment with Emil's siblings. Now, Emil was on to something bigger because other kids feel the same way. Sometimes when they're looking at their phone, they're like, oh, what? And then I'm like, <laughs> it's just all like annoying. Sometimes when I ask my mom to stop texting, she's just like, yeah, yeah, what? And then she just keeps texting. <laughs> well, my mom doesn't use her phone a lot, but my dad, he, he, he actually needs to use his phone a lot because it's for, from his work. But sometimes when he's on his phone for no reason, it's annoying. When my dad's on the phone and I, and I try to talk to him, um, he just gnaws, gnaws me. I me feel angry. Poor kids. According to Pew Research, 36% of parents admit that they struggle with the allure of screens. 51% of teens say they find their parent or caregiver to be distracted by their own cell phone when they're trying to have a conversation with them. But that distraction also doesn't stop at home. 15% of parents they say they lose focus at work because of their gadgets. That's nearly double the number of teens who say their phones distract them during school. Now, parent or not, if you actually want to know how much time you are spending on your phone, you can download an app called Moment. Kamal told me about it a few weeks ago, and the results are actually pretty shocking. Here's my report from the last few days. I didn't do too hot on Friday, but if you're in denial about your cell phone addiction, this will surely snap you out of it. Let us know what you think of your phone obsession, especially if you have kids. Our hashtag, ironically, if you're going to use your phone, is AJ Newsgrid. Yeah, Come on. so that's the conundrum, right? We're going to ask you to get in touch with us using something like WhatsApp or Twitter, which you need your phone. Actually, that Moment app, um, I deleted it because it got so annoying telling me how much time I was spending on my phone. It is a conundrum, but it is important, I think, to raise a point that while we're worrying so much about how much our kids are using them, we're probably using them way too much, he says, with a phone and an iPad and a computer all in front of him. That number, plus 97450111149, if you want to get in touch with us and tell us about how much you're using your phone. OK, we're talking sport now with Tatiana Boxing, and uh, you've got a big guest coming up today as well, haven't you? Big fight and a big guest. We do, yeah, and there's been a lot of drama surrounding it too. The drama has continued between Gennady Golovkin and Canelo Alvarez ahead of their world title fight later on Saturday, with the two having to be separated at the weigh-in on Friday night. More insults have been thrown between the pair ahead of a much-anticipated bout. The fight is going to be the second between the two. They battled out a draw one year ago. This rematch, however, was meant to happen in May, but Canelo failed two drugs tests, blaming it on eating contaminated meat. Look, I got excited from seeing all the fans. It motivated me to do that right now. I defeated him at the weigh-in, and now it's time to defeat him on Saturday. I saw he's like a clown. He's showman. He's not a true guy. Well, I'm pleased to be joined by former light welterweight world champion Amir Khan from Bolton in the UK. Amir, thank you very much for joining us on the News Grid. You fought Canelo before. How good is he? And what does he need to do to beat Golovkin? Well, Canelo, there's a lot that's been going on about Canelo. You know, obviously, he got caught with taking Clembutro. Uh, he says it was in the meat he ate. But obviously, at that level of being a fighter you know you never you want to eat organic food you want you probably go to the right butchers to get the food and everything and the right shops so i don't really believe that it was from the meat he ate that it was tested positive and then um obviously in this fight where he had big differences you can see the size difference in canelo canelo is not as big not as thick as he normally is he's a lot more leaner he's a lot more um he's a lot thinner than he used to be not as thick so, you know, you don't know if that maybe was something that he was taking for a long, long time. Now, when a fighter is off taking any sort of uh, substance, like steroids or whatever, 
mentally, when that's taken away from you, I think mentally that's going to play a very big part in the game because is he going to have the same power? Is he going to have the same strength? Is he going to be as fit and strong as he usually, usually is? So this is what's going to tell us a little bit. I mean, Gla- Gennady Golovkin is a true champion, fought the best out there, beat the best, knocked everyone out, has a lot of power. He's an Olympic champion himself. And uh, I just think he might have the number for this fight again, even though the first fight was very close. I just think this fight, I could see K- uh, Golovkin knocking out Canelo uh, because maybe he is, he is off all those substances. There's been a lot of drama, to say the least, ahead of the fight. How important is it to get that psychological edge over your opponent at the weigh-in? I think it's very important both both times because why why why it's good to promote this fight and with the drama that's gone on, I think it, it, it co-promotes this fight. It makes the fight even bigger than it was because people like, you know, as boxing fans, we like to see a little bit of drama before the fight because we know then the fight's going to be really exciting. Um... But, you know, I think um, both fighters are so experienced that sometimes the psychological matter doesn't really matter. They know they've trained hard. They know they're going to be fit and strong. And they know they're going to go in the ring and give it their best. So really, all these little games that they're playing, I don't think it's going to make a difference in the fight. And uh, Amir, what can we expect from you? Mayweather said earlier on today he wants to fight again. Is Khan versus Mayweather a fight that you want? I would love that fight. You know, Mayweather obviously is a fight I've been chasing for a long, long time and that never seemed to happen. But, um, you know, there's a lot of talks. There's a lot of opponents out there. There's the likes of Floyd Mayweather now. I hear wants to come back. Then you've got Manny Pacquiao. There's talks of me and Manny Pacquiao fighting for a long, long time. That fight could be possible. And also Kel Brook, a guy from UK, you know, who's in the same weight division as well, which will be a massive fight in someone like Wembley Stadium. So... I have a few big options. I know the next fight has to be a big fight. I want, I want it to be a big fight. And um, so whoever it is at the three, I think it's, all, it's, it's going to be massive. Amir Khan, all the best to you. Thanks for joining us on the News Grid. Thank you very much. As always, you can share your thoughts with us using the hashtag as ever. That is AJ Newsgrid. Or you can also tweet me directly at I am Tatiana. There's more sport coming up later with Paul in the 1800 GNT News Hour. But for now, Kamal, it is back to you. Thanks, Tatiana. And kudos to our producer, Sahel Malik, as well, for getting Amir Khan on the grid today. Always good to see some good names, some big names. Uh, making their time for us. That'll do it for The Grid. Uh, if you, Tatiana was just saying, hashtag AJ News Good if you want to get in touch with us. Any platform, Twitter, Facebook, that WhatsApp number. I always say this, but don't just send in questions and comments. If you've got a video comment or a video question or pictures of a story, send them in to us directly. We'd love to get them on the show and online. And in the meantime, we will see you back here in Studio 14 at Al Jazeera at 1500 hours GMT tomorrow, Sunday. <laughs>